So, but but the the point again is is like I mean, has it been more challenging, less challenging? I mean, you had the, you had the meeting a week ago, you know, kind of. You know, what's kind of like your thoughts as far as like different things that happened over the people, last People, everybody's different. Different people have come into the company and relationships have changed. People have changed, frankly. And what's exciting is clearly it isn't hurting the wrestling product and the that's people aren't hurting each other. Nothing that we can't get past that's happened or, the, you know, if somebody did cross the line, they wouldn't be with the company anymore. But, you know, as far as what happened with Eddie and Sammy that I'm not really don't want to get into, but other there's other stuff too, other people wrestlers not liking each other like i've said in another interview this weekend a lot of wrestlers don't like each other and some some of it's been a secret for a long time some of it's just coming out now some of it is new stuff that wasn't there before i don't think that's a bad thing as long as people aren't crossing the line with each other and if they do we need to get it in check and make sure that people aren't crossing the line but these things can be settled in the ring a lot of times too and there you know we're a company that is in the business of producing a product that is wrestling matches. We don't produce a product and we don't have a workplace where people need to be around each other eight to five, Monday through Friday every week. But when we do come together Wednesdays, Fridays, or like this weekend on pay-per-view, uh, we need people to be professional because the first word in professional wrestling is professional. The second word is wrestling. And it's a place where traditionally, a lot of the fans have known what wrestlers didn't like each other outside of the ring. And frankly, those tensions have played out on TV or in real life. And sometimes these things have played out in real life where the match never happened or the tension didn't even make box office sense yet. It drew because people knew there was like legit heat. So I do think a lot of people not liking each other and the stuff that's come out of these situations in recent weeks has been it, in some ways, it, it's challenging, but in other ways, I think it's not always detrimental to the box office of a wrestling company when people find out that the wrestlers hate each other. Well, if in in, in a situation, I'll even bring a pop punk and Moxley, and I'm not saying that they're like hating each other or anything like that, but when I watched some of the build of Punk and Moxley, I did get, you know, and I think I wrote this, is like I did get a Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels feel, which is, I think, I mean, it is a good thing. For the television show, it makes the television interviews very compelling. And I've seen it with other people. You know, sometimes if they, if you don't like each other, but you use it for your professional advantage, it's a good thing. I mean, obviously, sometimes, and Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels is a perfect example, sometimes it got in the way. And I mean, it did. It did get in the way. Um, Survivor with, Series 97 was also, I believe, the biggest drawing pay-per-view of 1997, wasn't it? Survivor Series well, 97 well, them, had a bigger for them, draw than for WrestleMania. Them, for them, for, yeah, it did outdraw WrestleMania. Um, I mean, the WCW actually beat it a couple times, but for WWE... I mean, I mean for WWE, Because obviously 1997, the big number for the year was Starcade. Right. And at the end of Starcade, like Starcade, people would point out, well, Starcade 97 did triple WrestleMania 13 that year. But, Roughly triple, yeah. And, and Starcade 97 is one of the biggest box office successes ever in the wrestling business. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, and I believe the biggest pay-per-views in the history of the business that were non-WrestleMania shows would be Invasion in 2001 and Starcade 97. Right, and the, and the one with um, Rodman and Malone. Yeah, was Those that are, was that about his biggest Starcade? Uh, it was just under, just okay. under. Just yeah, under. that was Those would be the three biggest. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so, well, in '97, I mean, the biggest WWF pay-per-view that year, I think, was Survivor Series '97. So it did help heat up the build. I think it was like, oh my god, they got they they got Brett and Sean in the ring together. And I would remember being, you know, a thirteen year old or uh, yeah, a thirteen year old kid, uh fourteen well, I guess fourteen year old kid at the time thinking that summer, like, man, how are uh they gonna get out of this with given that you can't even get the two guys in the ring together. Yeah. And so I do think situations like that can be compelling when you don't have people that don't necessarily like each other or want to hang out, but they're fine to fight each other and, and it, it can be good. So I, real life controversy, we can often channel it into the pro wrestling business and use it to be profitable. And I think in the nineties, there's a lot of other things that were happening that were not designed to be drawing like the way people conducted themselves on television, the way people talked about people, the way people talked about people that were not to even build wrestling matches. Cause like they were in different companies. Like there was this, like it was just, people thought it was cool like uh and so not everything made sense then either when people were calling each other out and they're not even on the same tv show so a legitimate dislike of other wrestlers i don't want it to cross the line where it's not safe backstage for people to you know 
have a cup of coffee and not worry about getting smacked in the mouth. But on the other hand, uh, if we can settle this stuff in the ring, then I'm all for it. So now, one of the things on, we, obviously, we got the uh, four-way for the women's championship, interim women's championship. So now you have, um, you've kind of set a precedent with Punk. He was injured. He was out for about three months. And you have with Rosa. So is there like a thing where, like if someone has... Let's just say he's out for a year. Are you going to do interim? But like, is there like three months or six months? I haven't set a timetable on it yet, and we're not sure how long Thunder Rosa is going to be out with the injuries. But with Punk, I knew it was going to be months at best, and I felt like it was the right thing to do. And Rosa, similar, I believe, hope timeline, where in months, you know, she could be back, and we could set up Thunder Rosa versus the interim world champion for an undisputed world championship. Uh, in the past, we established the interim. It was for shorter term things. Like actually when the, we the, did the Cody, and, match. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Cody and Sammy was yeah. a great example. And I thought, honestly, it made the ladder match more compelling and exciting to have the two belt story. And it was a big draw. And, and Beach Break was a really successful show. A lot of great things happening back there in January. That was another, really one of them was Cody and Sammy. But then it was that was challenging when we started the year because Cody got sick and wasn't available because he, you know, the, 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 because that's what's the nature of COVID. But that was a different one because obviously we felt pretty good that he was going to be back in a couple weeks. Um, whereas sometimes if you had a longer term injury, if somebody had an ACL tear and was out a year, that's a great question that thankfully we haven't had to deal with with a champion being out for a full year. Um, you know, it's been more manageable injuries. And I hope that this is one of those. Garrett, do you have anything? Before uh, we, we let you plug the show and stuff, you mentioned something you'd been studying, something in history that you. you wanted to bring up. Yes. So I've, I've got a bit of good news before I uh, bring up my historical thing I wanted to just talk about and, and just have a fun conversation about uh, that it doesn't relate to All Out before I go plug All Out a lot. <laughs> um, I, in regards to All Out, it's, we made some history for our AEW because it's the third straight AEW event. And the third ever, it's a it's a new streak of milestones. It's the third AEW pay per view in a row to hit the million dollar live gate. Oh, so you hit the million dollar mark? Yeah, just did. Wow, awesome, awesome. Yeah, I've been. I think I, last time I talked to you, I was I was closer to nine seventy five or nine fifty. So nine fifty. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, and we've we've been steadily hitting it. So we were over a million dollar gate for this pay per view, uh, which is another big bo box office benchmark for us, and very cool uh, that it's our third straight pay per view to do it. So, so real quick before we go into history, because I always did want to ask you. So, do you have, um, do you in your mind at this point kind of have something planned up, kind of framework for Toronto and for, um, you know, the the Grand Slam show yes. in New York? Yes, so, I see so, those as big TV milestones in between All Out and Full Gear that we have Grand Slam, Dynamite, and Rampage, uh, and that it could potentially be the first AEW TV ever to hit the million dollar gate. We're very similar to what the we Grand were last Slam year. Grand Slam or, or Toronto? Or Grand both? Slam, well, Tor Toronto across the two days, uh, I think we're, yeah, going to be way, uh, you know, well over in, in Canadian uh, d dollars, yes. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but for um, the... Uh, for So for the all, Grand Slam... This year could be the first year we've ever done a million dollar live gate for TV. Last year it was about nine sixty. I told yeah, yeah. you, and this year uh, I think it'll be a good chance to get the million dollar live gate. And also, uh, you know, Toronto and Grand Slam, in addition to being shows that are really commercially successful for us in terms of selling tickets, I think they're really great opportunities for exciting pay per view feel events on TV. And so I definitely have huge plans for. Grand Slam in New York, September 21st, Wednesday, and September 23rd, Friday. And those shows in Toronto, uh, October 12th, Dynamite, and the October 14th, Rampage. And what about England? Anything new as far as, can you say 2023? Can you say... I don't want to say for sure. I, I, I'm making progress on it. Just as Craven Cottage, the Riverside stand, we've made so much progress on it. Uh, but we're, when we get there at Craven Cottage, it's some, absolutely something I really do want to do. And I feel like Craven Cottage has uh, come a long way. And when, when it gets to where I want it to be and where uh, my dad and our, you know, team want it to be and we can find a way to make it happen certainly AEW in the UK is definitely going to happen you know we're the number one wrestling company in the UK and we're doing our best numbers ever it's been a big month for ratings because you know uh not only the streak 
in the demo, which is the key number, but also P2 is, is a really good metric that people like to look at. And the million yeah. n- viewer number, it seems to be like the number. If it's over it, people are happy with it. And if it's under it by a tiny bit. It, it, no, I don't care about it. But, no, but, but the average. <laughs> but, but, but but average I, know, fans, I know. It's I know. a big thing. I know so, a million's a nice benchmark number. Sure. And absolutely. So we've been doing really good numbers through the summer off and on but to have our first back-to-back weeks with a million p2 i think that is a nice metric well, especially for this summer because i mean like let's face it like even though wwe is doing great i mean as yeah. far as, as as far as the monday show in particular but the people who are watching i mean look i watch that i look at that chart every like you do i'm sure yep. yeah i look at the chart every day and those number one shows on nights other than sunday monday and wednesday um are really low and wednesday realistically and monday even except for the wrestling shows you know, there's not a lot of big number shows. Yep. I mean, it's the audience. We talked about this before is that the total audience watching cable this summer is is lower, but you're holding up and you're doing, you know, more viewers and they're holding up and they're actually they're, they've, they've had some great success in yeah. recent weeks. Yeah. And I think we have, too. I think it's yeah. and I don't want to overshadow that. Hey, if you're a big fan of Wrestling Observer Radio, we got 12,000 episodes of all of our podcasts up at our website, WrestlingObserver.com. If you sign up today, you get access to every single one of them. The 12 to 18 new shows that we do every single week. You can podcast them, listen to them on the road, at work, working out, in the shower, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And also full access to the Wrestling Observer newsletter and archives. So if you love what you hear, head to WrestlingObserver.com. 12,000 audio shows at your fingertips.